Hey everyone, welcome to Lobby Talks, the new event series by Atollo. My name's James Lemon, your host and the founder of Atollo, um, and I'm going to be taking you through a whistle-stop tour of another industry leader. We like to meet in a lobby, share some ideas, wish we could do it in real life, but we are as flexible as ever. For those of you that don't know, Atollo is a community set up to inspire, develop and connect the hospitality, hospitality industry, which obviously has been through a really tough time over the last 18 months. But we continue to find and nurture those with passion and bring people together for mentorship, discussions, the sharing of ideas. We're convinced that together we can absolutely rebuild the industry stronger than ever. So whatever your interest, whether it be hotels, restaurants, events, or in the supply chain, feel free to join our journey. It's all free at myatolo.com. We are here to help support, and I'm sure you'll find a group of people who are able to help and support. I want to get straight into it because I am super excited about our guest today, and I know we're going to have absolutely tons to talk about. Um, so, uh, Fred, welcome up on stage. Hey, James. <laughs> Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Great to have you here. So, Fred, you and I met, I reckon it was about a year ago because Atollo has been partnered with Gleon and Gleon's Alumni Association for about a year. So anyone in this alumni association can come onto Atollo. And you've always blown me away at just how enthusiastic you are for industry initiatives and giving back and supporting. So thanks again for sharing some time with us today. I'm sure we'll have tons of stuff to discuss. Absolutely. Happy to be here. And I'm excited with this new series that you've launched. And I'm, uh, I'm really happy to be part of it. And indeed, it's an industry about people and uh, service. And so if we don't connect, uh, I don't know how it can be an industry of people. So really happy we get to connect today. Perfect. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, look, let's get straight into it. So before we kind of hear more about you, I want to hear more about where we're meeting. So uh, where, which lobby have you taken us to in the world and why are we here? So I picked the, the, the hotel lobby of the Renaissance Paris Vendôme, which is the first hotel I've ever worked at uh, as uh, one of my internships in Glion. I did Glion Hotel School and uh, um, that was one of my first internships. And I really, to this day, uh, still have a special place in my heart for, for, for this hotel. Uh, and let me tell you just in a few seconds a, a little story about that hotel. So it was my second internship with Glion. I was supposed to work at a private concierge service, very high end, really cool. I was really looking forward to do that. And then a few days before Christmas, they tell me, well, sorry, you, your internship fell through. We don't have budget to support you. And here I am, Christmas, uh, and I have no internship, and I need to start in January. Yeah. Well, sometimes life happens, and uh, you find something that will change your life. And so I found an internship at the Renaissance Paris Vendôme on the 26th of December. I had an interview on the 25th. Got the got the, the 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 internship on twenty sixth. Started on the fifth of January. Figured out a place in Paris to live and 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 all sorts of fun stuff in a week. But that was my first introduction to Marriott, and I've then spent ten years uh, at Marriott, and uh, I'll uh, I'll go through it afterwards. Yeah. Uh, but that's why this hotel has a special place for me because I've learned the ropes and I've learned most of uh, what I know about uh, Marriott there. Yeah, no, fantastic. They say fortune favors the brave. And I definitely have heard a lot that in hospitality, if you want to get ahead, you just have to be proactive. You have to make things happen. You have to meet the right people. And it sounds like you took what could have been a pretty un unfortunate situation and just like, this won't do. I'm going to make it work. And it looks like you absolutely land on your feet. What a gorgeous lobby. So great to be here. Let's let's crash back on the sofas and uh, and catch up properly. So let's get started. And we'd, you know, I'm sure our audience would love to get to know you, Fred. So we ask all our guests if they can summarize their career in 60 seconds. Do you think you're up for the challenge? Yep, definitely. Go for it. <laughs> all right. So I did Guillaume Hotel School. And then after that, uh, I started, I joined Marriott. So just after my internship at Renaissance Vendôme, I finished my studies and uh, called them uh, and, and said, well, look, I really want to work for Marriott. I think that's the, that's the best company in hospitality. And they said, well, we have an opening in Paris uh, for a new hotel in sales. And uh, that is opening five days after you graduate. So I was like, fantastic, count me in. And so I opened a four-star hotel just outside of Paris uh, after graduating, did that for a year and a half, sales development. It was amazing. Uh, and thanks to Glion and, and what I've learned there, I was able to help. You know, we had a 
a strike from the house uh, housekeeping team and so i was able to uh, to, to do the, the the rooms in 20 minutes uh we had some uh, shortage in the restaurant and i was able to help uh, do the service and, and and even help a bit in the kitchen so all of the things that i've learned in my hotel school really helped me from the get-go um, and after a year and a half in sales uh the opportunity came up to lead the e-commerce uh, for the hotels in paris uh, from marriott and so it was a new field it was a new position and uh, it was really exciting because back in 2010, e-commerce was not what it is today. And so it was uh, uncharted territory that, uh, that I got to cover. And uh, with a little bit of time, I covered hotels in France. And then they, they, they gave me part of the European team to manage. And shortly after that, I joined Merit uh, headquarters in the US uh, to oversee search engine optimization for 14 out of the 15 websites they have. So namely uh, the 14 in-language sites from French to Japanese to Spanish to, to, to Chinese. And that was a fantastic experience. Again, uh, building a, a position, building a team uh, across the world, uh, hiring agencies. That was an exciting time. Um, shortly after that, about two years in uh, this uh, SEO role, I uh, took another role in Merit's internal uh, digital agency, which is called Merit Digital Services. And again, this agency was doing only English and American uh, source markets, and I was hired to develop the international source market so that a hotel in New York could speak uh, in a relevant way to Chinese consumers and attract them to come to New York, or a French hotel to attract Spanish consumers, or a Mexican hotel to attract French customers. All of that had to be done in a very cost-effective way because we were a cost-recoverable um, department, so we couldn't make profit and we couldn't make loss. So that made very interesting. And again, it was a new position. I got to, to develop a team, develop uh, agencies around the world to, uh, to effectively drive digital marketing. So that was fantastic, um, and I really enjoyed my almost 10 years at Marriott. But then I had the opportunity to come back to Switzerland uh, and then Geneva, my hometown, to join Rolex uh, again with a blank, uh, with a wild card uh, to uh, drive digital transformation in their sales department. And I felt that it was a fantastic opportunity to learn new things and grow uh, my skills into a new industry. And so I brought what I've learned in uh, hospitality uh, in a digital, uh, from a digital perspective to the, to the luxury industry and to the watch industry. And after three years with Rolex, I decided it was time to, um, to uh, create my own company. And so earlier this year, I created my own consulting firm focusing on digital innovation, digital marketing, and digital coaching. And of course, uh, since I've done that pretty much at the same time, I was fortunate enough to become a mentor on Otolo and uh, that has proven to be a, a, a very, uh, very empowering um, experience. Perfect. As if you weren't busy enough, you thought, well, look, let me let me volunteer and give back. Look, I'd be remiss, Fred, if I didn't point out that you are terrible at sticking to time. That was way more than 60 seconds. <laughs> but, but we'll forgive you because we're all friends Sorry about here. that. <laughs> and, and you spend so much of your time volunteering. No, absolutely fine. I'm just teasing. And actually, I don't, I'm going to make it even worse. I don't want to move on without asking you one question that always comes to mind when you tell stories like this what's the secret source from that leap from one role to another you know what's happening in the three to six months before because you haven't progressed in a straight line right you didn't know you wanted to be gm you've ended up traveling between countries between functions what's that secret source I don't know if there's one secret sauce, but I think there are, there are a few ingredients. The first ingredient is not to be afraid of unknown. And so this is something that I've always demonstrated, always said, look, give me a blank sheet. That's what excites me. Give me a set of instructions and processes and I'm going to be bored. And so kind of demonstrating this and demonstrating the ability to say, OK, we are in uncharted territory. We, we know roughly where we want to go, but we don't know the process and figuring it out, taking the risk uh, and getting the rewards when, you, when you're successful and learning fast when you're failing. I think these are abilities um, that are helping people to, to move in, uh, in, in different ways like this. And that certainly has helped me um, in, uh, in, in making these, uh, these changes. Brilliant. So kind of standing out, asking for projects, showing that you're interested in trying the next, the next new thing. Absolutely. Love it. Love it. Great. Well, look, let's not, I mean, you've, you've got us massively behind now, so let's not dawdle. Right. The next section is called Good Day, Bad Day. And we love to explain this industry through, frankly, its ups and downs. And we know it creates the best and the worst of experiences. So start wherever you want. Take us through a couple of the days of your career, if you would. 
Sure, absolutely. I mean, in general, a good day is a day where I can help someone else and I can help the company, I can help a project and I can make things move. So that's in general, a really good day. But there's one day that I reminisce uh, very fondly is my first day at uh, Merit headquarters. So I got there and Honestly, when I started with Merit, I thought I would go to the headquarters maybe when I was 50. And I got there before I was 30. And so it was an amazing day to say, look, I'm part of something that is much bigger uh, than me now. It's uh, it's absolutely amazing uh, to, be, to, to be there. And just the energy and uh, the, the world of opportunities that, that opened up made it for a really, really good day. Um, but in general, uh, what makes my day really good is when, when I feel that I've made a difference, I've made an impact um, with someone else and I've, I've, I've truly changed uh, their day. Some of the very good days are days that I've had with my Otolo mentees, um, such as one that was looking for a change in career going from hospitality to, to tech. And before uh, we started the mentoring, he, he had interviews but never got job offers. A few weeks in, he got to choose between two job offers. And so that was a really, really good day. Uh, on a bad day, it's usually when I don't get to help people or I feel that I, I haven't achieved up to the standards that I set to myself. Um, but then what I've always tried to do is say, look, it's, it's been a bad day. What can I do differently uh, the next time? And uh, a good technique for that uh, little giveaway is at the, end of, at the end of each week, I, I try to look at five things I'm happy about and five things I'm unhappy about. And the five unhappy ones, I'm trying to find solutions not to redo them uh, again. And this has proven to be uh, pretty uh, successful. Yeah, yeah. I'm hearing a lot more about this, uh, you know, in this world of kind of mindfulness and meditation that people are talking a lot about kind of micro wins, right? This idea that you should never be too tough on yourself, but also you should never think too much of yourself and actually just taking a moment just to write down a few things you're genuinely doing well and a few things you need to work on really help can you share share a bit more i guess on the on the development side what are some of the things you're you're working on at the moment well, some of so some of the things that I that I'm working on is is, is to celebrate and in, indeed the, the macro victories and focus more on the wins than, than than focus on the things that you need to change. I think that's really something that is um, that many people share this ability to uh, to tell let to to tell yourself down but not tell yourself up uh, enough. So I think that's really important. And learning how to let go is really important. And as a as a multiple startup uh, creator and owner, uh, you know it better than anyone, uh, James. Um, learning to let go on the on what is not important, not crucial, uh, to focus on the on, on the right thing is is, is also key. Uh, and giving yourself a break uh, sometimes is uh, is is a good advice because you cannot be a hundred percent of the time at two hundred percent of your capacity. You have to have your ups and downs, but learn to identify them and learn to grow out of them. And if you make a mistake, because it will happen learn from it uh don't let it happen again uh but don't uh blame yourself for the next 10 years because you made a mistake yeah yeah no great <laughs> really good advice so look coming back to your coming back to your best day right this idea of you walking through the marriott kind of hq i wonder is that do you think that's something that a lot of hotel kind of workers as you reach that kind of heads of department level aspire to and if so what do you think's going on there what's that mindset of you know why people want to join hqs and, and i suppose what are some of your tips for people who are looking at those headquarters jobs as to, as to some of the things they can be doing in their last couple of years of working in the hotel itself? That's a good question. I think that um, you either want to stay in operations and you're not interested at all with the headquarters or you just want to go there because you know that's where usually most of the things are decided and that the greater skill of, uh, of strategy is, is being decided on. Mm. And so for example, something that they that, that they do to, to mix the two worlds is there is an award for the best associates uh, each year because they're called associates, not employees. And one of the rewards, one of the key moments of receiving your award is to actually walk into uh, headquarters and you have all employees, so all 4,000 employees from the headquarters lining up and clapping for you. And there's 12 people re receiving the award each year. So you're 12 walking in front of 4,000 people clapping for you and making sure that you know that you're really special. Uh, even And most of these awardees are from properties and they, they've been working for 10 years, for 20 years as a bellman, as a housekeeper, and they, they've done outstanding work. And this reward coming to headquarters, having this amazing um, uh, crowd cheering for you, I think showcases the culture in the, in the company. And maybe that's why people want to go to headquarters is to feel that culture. Mm. Uh, and not being alone in a in, in a hotel, they want to be part of this uh, phenomenal company.
Yeah, yeah. So it's a funny contradiction in a way, isn't it? Because a lot of people get passionate about this industry to serve. And actually, a lot of, you know, once you reach headquarters, you're, you're that little bit further away from your guests. You're from that little bit further away from having a fast impact. You tend to probably be involved in programs and longer term decision making. So it's, a, it's an interesting switch, but it's definitely one that seems to hold a lot of appeal um, for, for those in hotels. So. Uh, it does, it? and 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 I would say it's it's even better if you're coming from the hotel background because you bring that experience from in the field. Uh, I, I remember some of the decisions that we that we were making uh, from a search perspective. We said, "Oh, we're just going to do that," and I was like, "No, we're not," because on property, it's not going to be possible mm -hmm. to to enable that because they just don't have the bandwidth, they don't have the budget, they don't have this. So I think coming from property to headquarters is actually an asset. Because you're bringing that uh, that field experience uh, that sometimes might be lacking to uh, headquarter lifers. Yeah, and I hope I hope hotel chains really start to nurture that. I was on a really interesting panel on World Travel Market W2M um, in London, and that's exactly the discussion we're having. Uh, are we too quick in this industry to hire externally and say, actually, you know what? Rather than nurture within and and really kind of bring people up through the ranks and give them a try in different functions and roles. Do we sometimes take the easy way out and just hire in from a competitor or hire in from another another um, business? And hopefully, the hospitality industry has shown that our workers are incredibly resilient and able to multitask. That kind of cross training that you were talking about in your first hotel, I think, is exactly what people have been doing in the last eighteen months. Right, serving drinks in the morning, checking people in in the afternoon, and grabbing a screwdriver and putting the doors back on and, at night. I think that's really been the experience of the last eighteen months. So, hospitality people. Have can, can yeah. go to unknown skill levels, I think. Absolutely. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, look, our next section is called Last Day on Earth. It's definitely one of my favorites. We love to showcase just, you know, the best day of hospitality. So let's, let's you know, without being too morbid, let's live, move, move to a world where the world's ending tomorrow. But luckily, you've got VIP access to absolutely any hotel, restaurant and event. Where would you take us? Where would you stay? That's a really tough one because even beyond Marriott, I have a lot of great destinations that I love and uh, and and there there's so many on my bucket list that I, I haven't taken uh, right now. Uh, but the first uh, the first attribute of that last day on earth and it's really important for me and that is something that has been driving me throughout my career is I'd be spending that day with my family. Uh, so I have two young kids, two young boys, and a wonderful wife, and it would be with them wherever in the world. It would be uh, it would be for them and with them. Uh, now, if I have to pick uh, a specific hotel or a specific place, uh, I would actually wish to be able to teleport myself uh, and 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 be in, in different places. At, at Teleportation the same time. is completely acceptable for this exercise. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> then 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 I'll start at the JW uh, Marriott in Venice, which is on its private island, which is a gorgeous hotel um, and uh, a really special experience and so I would start there uh, then I would go to Hong Kong and in Hong Kong there's a lot of opportunities but the Ritz Carlton in Hong Kong is uh, one of my favorite hotels uh, especially the O2 bar that is I think on the 140th uh, floor which is which gives you an amazing view over the bay. Uh, and so that would be my, my next stop. I would stop for a little time uh, at a small independent hotel in Tokyo which name just escapes me right now, uh, but I'll continue because I know we're short on time. Uh -huh. uh, but it gave me one of the most amazing service and just give me a minute to describe that. So I was there for a business trip, three days. Um, on the second day, I was uh, off and I had the morning to go and, 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 and go around. The bellboy not only recognized me by name, but recognized I was not in suit. And so he said, well, wh what are you exploring today? And I explained what I was wanted to explore. And he said, well, you know, there's this and that and that. And as we were discussing, he t he led me through to the to the metro uh, and gave me a ticket and said, have a good day, Mr. Shao. All of that, I did not feel anything. Mm. And it was just a marvelous service. So I would go back to that hotel, uh, which was absolutely fabulous. And then, of course, I'll finish in the Renaissance Vendôme, in the hotel we're staying at, because I think it's a, it's, it's a hidden gem, uh, perfectly located. Uh, and I absolutely love this hotel. Yeah, perfect. Now you've got some examples, some really lovely hotels there. And I think if anyone wants to geek out on probably particularly luxury, but also great service, feels like you've got some pretty good ideas. How about how about restaurants? I know work wise, you're a hotel guy, but where would you where would you spend your last your last meal on earth? Oh, that's an easy one. I've had the pleasure of uh, eating at uh, Osteria Francescana, which is a hotel by Mas uh, restaurant by Massimo Bottura uh, in Modena, Italy. 
Um, he was awarded best chef in the world, I think, a couple times, uh, 2019 and 2020, uh, and maybe 2018. He's featured in Chef's Table on Netflix. If you if you want to if you want to look at it, and what struck struck me when I when when I ate there uh, was that the whole experience was perfect from one end to the other. The 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 sitting, the lighting, the 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 table, everything was perfect, and then what you had in your in, in your plate was just out of this world. I've, I was fortunate enough to do a lot of uh, a very good restaurants. This one stood out completely. Um, and the creativity in the plates is just absolutely amazing. Yeah, fantastic. What do you think it is that's happening behind the curtain at restaurants like that? You know, in the kitchen and with the staff that means that they can create that kind of that service and that experience night after night. You know, what, what is it that other restaurants could you know, learn from, do you think, in, in amazing places like that? Well, I think the first thing is the team, the team that works together and works as if they were one. Uh, we could we, we could see the waiters and the chefs uh, being completely aligned and knowing each other super well and trusting each other. And I think that's uh, that's one of the assets of a good team, whichever the industry, but in particular in the in, in the hospitality world, having a team that trusts each other, that has each other's back uh, is really important and that knows where to take the strength. Um, so, for example, when I was at that restaurant, um, the menu was one that he had to create during the lockdown. And so mm -hmm. it was inspired by the different commies and sous chefs uh, in the in his team. And so all of the all of the dishes had an inspiration that was mixed. And I think you only create that when you trust your team enough to co-create your three Michelin star experience. So building a team that trusts each other, that um, that works well together, uh, will empower any hotel or any restaurant to have an efficient service and differentiate itself from any other restaurant. Yeah, fantastic. I also wonder if there's something in that empowerment of your team that means people will be more likely to want to come and work with you, stay with you and grow with you, right? And that really is the industry's biggest challenge right now. Maybe we aren't putting enough trust in teams to deliver these occasions, deliver these experiences. And who wants to work in a, in a place where you're micromanaged or where you're doing exactly the same thing every day? Kind of the essence of your career, I suppose. Absolutely. And that empowerment, I, I would make a parallel with the sports industry, with the group sports industry, you know, team sports. Mm. The coach has to let the team on the, on, on the field. The, the coach is not with the team on the field. And so you do the training, you do everything, and you nurture the team spirit. But at some point, your team is gonna is gonna run alone in the in the restaurant or alone in, the, in running the hotel, and so it's the role of the GM or of the of the restaurant manager to build that team spirit uh, and that trust and that empowerment. Indeed, as you as you were mentioning, it, and, and without giving too many flowers uh, to, uh, to to Marriott, I think one of the, their great thing is for Ritz Carlton, where the Ritz Carlton ladies and gentlemen are entitled to a specific amount a day to wow the guests. And so without approval from their manager, they allowed, if it helps, to make something different for the guest. Okay, so that's, that's the last thing. That's the last nice thing you're allowed to say about Marriott. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's, uh, you know, after 10 years, you just uh, kind of uh, have the virus. But I, and, I, and I do believe it. Uh, I think it's maybe maybe one of the things you can do on a Tolo is meet some people from other hotel companies and be like, oh, how do you guys do it? And I'll have more stories from other industries. No, I'm just teasing. I mean, what, what, a great, what a great company for us all to learn from, I think. And I think there's something that these big brands do that is is obviously really special. And Fritz Carlton's no, no exception. I think um, there's great kind of books and podcasts on that that experience in particular, right? And how it applies to other industries. Cool. Absolutely. Good stuff. Well, look, now we really do want to hear from you in our last section, which we call the guest book. So obviously, like when you leave any hotel, you should leave a review and always leave some top tips for other travelers. So we'd love you to share your words of wisdom. You know, what have you learned in your time that you'd want to pass on? What do you discuss with your mentees as you think about kind of imparting knowledge to the next generation sure and that's one where i would like to have 45 minutes because uh i i, I just love i mean I'm, I'm not a mentor for nothing i'm, I'm really happy to uh to, to do that and and have these exchange moments yeah. uh the first thing i would uh, i would give as a tip to future leaders uh of their teams in hospitality or outside of hospitality is get to know your team to a point where it's almost personal and you know exactly how to get the best out of them and not get the best out of them for you or for the company, but for themselves. And so when you're, when you're able to nurture uh, that response, that, that, that relationship with your teams, I think it creates something different. 
And when you are looking at yourself uh, as a leader and as a role as a leader is not just to give orders and, and give tasks and give goals, but it's really to help people grow and grow beyond what they thought that they could do. So that would be my first tip is as a future leader or as an existing leader, look into your people, understand your people, understand what works, what doesn't work. I remember a guy that hated to be praised uh, in front of everyone. And so for, for a little while, you praise that person. You say, look, Eric, you're doing a fantastic job. It's, it's absolutely amazing. And you see that person unhappy. And then you realize because you have that relationship with them that they actually prefer a pat in the back in private and say, look, you've done a really good job that has more impact than the, than the public praise. Or someone that doesn't feel at ease with digital and that feels that uh, they need extra training helping them identify the right training and taking them to the next step is something that is extremely empowering uh, and, and extremely powerful for them. So as a leader, you should think about the others uh, and, and how you can help them grow. So that's my first tip. Uh, the second thing is understand that we're in a global world and that your team is probably uh, not coming from the same background or the same culture or the same walk of life as, as you do. And so work, work out these assumptions and remove these assumptions that you might have and try to really understand uh, your team and, 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 how, um, and how each team member works, functions, and what they can bring uh, to, the, to the team effort. So that was more on the, on, on the team side. I'll try to wrap up as well, um, back to innovation and, and, and to, being, uh, to being a trailblazer. I would say challenge status quo. Uh, the we've always done it this way sentence is really a dangerous one challenge status quo, find new ways, but don't do tech for the sake of tech. Uh, don't do digital or innovation for the sake of it. Do it because it helps your customers, your clients, uh, because it makes it better for them and then figure out which tech uh, will help you do that. So that would be my two, uh, two advice. And I had a quote from Mr. Marriott, but I'm not going to use it because apparently I'm not allowed to use it anymore. <laughs> no, that's really unfair. No, uh, great. I have to stick by my principles and that's been enough. <laughs> Three or four references have been enough, but maybe someone else said the same quote and you can use it another time. Or just say okay. it's from you. No, really good stuff. But I think that's a really interesting one, isn't it? And I wonder if leaders maybe don't take enough time because we're such an SOS industry, right? What problems we have to fix today? What guests have got problems? What lift has broken down? And so maybe we don't take take time to make that time. I guess being in those leadership roles in a hotel where it is frantic, and of course it's never been more frantic than it is right now. How do you encourage hotel managers to carve out the time? Because obviously they're you know everyone is flat out and you can't necessarily take someone aside for half an hour very easily. It'd be great to kind of any kind of practical advice. And I suppose as a leader, if you're leading a lot of people, what are you doing with that information? Are you jotting it down somewhere? It'd be great to kind of get get practical on actually how do you how do you do that with your team? Sure, absolutely. I, th I think the first thing is to recognize that under too much pressure, you're not going to make always the right decisions. And so mm -hmm. you're not going to lead your team in the right way. So acknowledging that fact and saying, OK, you know what? I should take a step back. And are these the, the best decisions I can make? Or am I ill-informed? Do I need more information, et cetera? And really trying to, to have a critical thinking of all the thousands of decisions we, we, we make every day. As a leader, you must ensure that the critical decisions of the day are the right ones. Mm -hmm. And so doing that usually uh, requires to take a step back. And it will be so rewarding to take that step back, take, take that five minutes uh, away from your day um, to think about the way you do things and think why you're doing it uh, is really going to make a, a, a tremendous change because we all have a different reaction to stress. We all have a different reaction to, to, to what happens in, in the hotel or in our lives. Taking a step back will empower you to be a better leader and to, be, um, to, to, be a, to make better decisions, more informed decisions. Perfect. Perfect. No, really good stuff. Well, look, unfortunately, we are reaching the end of our time together, but we managed to, between the two of us, we managed to keep to time quite nicely. So it's all good. So unfortunately, we've kind of we've reached the checkout, really. It's time to uh, to say our goodbyes and settle up the bill. But look, I think firstly, I, I want to say a huge thanks, Fred. I know, just know how busy you are, not only with, of course, your mentoring and your um, Gleon alumni work, but course building a new business and and um you know getting that up get off the ground so thanks for sharing with us i think my reflection really is like for me you've got a reputation as a 
a tech leader, someone that people can go to to really understand what is this story of digital transformation? What is this revolution that has to happen in hospitality? And you've been there from e-commerce to systems, and, and I think you know it, but I think you've really shown us today there's a real human side to everything in hospitality. You've, you've been there on the front line of hotels. You've got this really in-depth understanding of how to build strong teams and get things done. So really appreciate you taking the time to share some of those stories with us. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me and uh, letting me uh, rumble a bit about uh, about some stuff that, I, that I've seen in my career. Um, it's really a pleasure to be on a total pleasure to be on Lobby Talks, pleasure to, to be working with you. And, uh, and I look forward to continuing it to everyone that is in hospitality today. Keep up the great work. Uh, stay positive. Uh, we're going to get out of this only together. That's the only way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Second that and the pleasure's all ours. Thank you, Fred. So we're really excited, everyone. We're going to be back next Tuesday. We have our lunchtime slot. We're going to be back with Harriet Brown. Harriet works for Too Good To Go, an innovative food waste company that I absolutely love. In fact, to tell you a secret, we actually use them today as a team for lunch. So she's going to be telling me about her stories, what's going on in hospitality, what's happening in sustainability. So you definitely do not want to miss that. Um, that's Tuesday the 9th at 12.30 uh, UK time. For now, though, Fred, thanks so much for your generous time preparing for this, doing it, and all the time you spend on Atollo. It's been a lot of fun sharing lobby talks with you, and I'll see you at something soon. And to everyone else, stay safe and look after yourselves. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.